Colorado, steam, steam railroading, narrow gauge steam, mountain narrow gauge. After a century and a quarter, one without any of the others would be unthinkable. And now, it only gets better. There is no better place to get a comprehensive overview of the three-foot gauge steam railroading in the Colorado Rockies today and a century ago than at the Colorado Railroad Museum at Golden. Here you can see rail equipment ranging from galloping geese to a huge standard gauge Burlington steam locomotive. But the star performers are the diminutive narrow gauge equipment led by number 346, a rugged little Class C-19 consolidation built by Baldwin in 1881 for the Denver and Rio Grande. Today, number 346 is putting on quite a sight and sound show as it goes through its paces during one of the occasional steam up days at the museum. Number 346 was saved from scrapping by Robert W. Richardson shortly after World War II. It and most of the equipment collected by Bob Richardson came to Golden, 12 miles west of Denver, in 1958 when the museum was started. The legendary Rio Grande Southern was abandoned in 1951. The narrow gauge road, known far and wide for its genteel poverty and rustic equipment, provided the first significant amount of equipment for the collection that grew into the museum. What was bought for scrap prices in the early 1950s is priceless today. Internal combustion is represented at the museum by this tiny locomotive, which handles switching chores on non-steam days. The track along the base of South Table Mountain at the museum is short, but it provides the opportunity for one of the most historic steam locomotives in Colorado and its equipment to show off railroading of over a century ago. Just watch and listen to that steam locomotive, over 110 years young and still going strong. Are we really in the 1990s? The famous narrow gauge circle once offered an unequaled trip through the Rockies. One could ride as a passenger from Denver to Durango, Silverton, Alamosa, and other fascinating locations in the mining areas of Colorado and New Mexico.
we continue west for another 15 miles to Silver Plume, home of the Georgetown Loop Railroad, otherwise known as the Georgetown Breckenridge and Leadville. Until its abandonment in 1939, this was part of a three-foot gauge line on the Colorado and Southern Railroad extending west from Denver. Starting in the late 1960s, track was relayed on six and one-half miles of the original roadbed and eventually over a recreation of the spectacular 96-foot high curved Devil's Gate Viaduct where the track loops over itself. Today, locomotive number 12, a three-truck Shea-geared locomotive built by Lima for the West Side Lumber Company in California, is doing the honors. Two other Shays from West Side Lumber and a pair of consolidations from Central America also see occasional use. Listen from the cab to those gears as number 12 takes its train from Silver Plume to Georgetown, a community noted for the gold rush Victorian architecture of its houses. The tops of the vertical cylinders that are the heart of the Shea locomotive can just be seen behind the engineer's hand as he operates the brakes. The Shea is running tender first as it descends the steep mountainside. Clear Creek Canyon provides a rugged mountainous panorama to people both on and off the train. The descent to Georgetown involves a steep grade and some mighty sharp curves and rugged terrain. turntable bridge, so named because it was constructed using the frame of an old turntable, which was found as an integral part of a Denver building being demolished at the time the railroad was being rebuilt in the 1970s. Here it is, Devil's Gate Viaduct, an accurate recreation of the original bridge, which was removed when the road was abandoned in 1939. A substantial gift in the early 1980s provided the funds to build an identical replacement span. It is a breathtaking view from the bridge, and the locomotive engineer is in no hurry to get his train across. Once it is across the bridge, the train continues to follow the track down grade and underneath the bridge to reach the end of track at Georgetown. Soon, Shea number 12 has run around its train at Georgetown and proceeds back over the trestle and up grade to Silver Plume.
Maintaining steam locomotives is a never-ending task on the Georgetown Loop Railroad and anywhere else. These well-used tools hanging on the rack inside the shop at Silver Plume provide mute testimony to this. If they could only talk, what stories these tools could tell of steam locomotives scrapped long ago and of steam locomotives today. Number 40, a consolidation built by Baldwin in 1920 and a sister locomotive were brought in from Central America to run on the Georgetown Loop Railroad. Part of the vast narrow-gauge operations of the Denver and Rio Grande ran from Chama, New Mexico to Antonito, Colorado. Chama, New Mexico, for nearly a century, the crew change point of the Denver and Rio Grande Western's three-foot gauge line from Alamosa to Durango. Today, the narrow-gauge rails are gone west of Chama to Durango, but 65 miles of slim gauge to the east still twist and turn up and over Cumbres and on to Antonito as the Cumbres and Toltec Railroad. Little has really changed at Chama as the hostlers go about their timeless tasks at the engine house to prepare numbers 484 and 488, a pair of former Rio Grande class K36 Mikados built by Baldwin in 1925 for their day's work. At the nearby station, Mike number 487 heads up the passenger train to Osier. Today, 65 miles of the Cumbres and Toltec connect Chama, New Mexico and Antonito, Colorado. Passenger trains leave from both ends and meet at Osier before returning to their respective terminals. In a scene virtually unchanged from the Rio Grande glory days of the 1930s and 1940s, number 487 departs Chama with its eastbound train. With an appropriate amount of bell ringing, number 487 blows steam out of its cylinder cocks and gets underway. One of the first crossings east of Chama provides a sweeping broadside view of number 487 at work, complete with steam, cinders, and its whistle. A little farther east, number 487 at its train thread their way through the narrows. The climb is starting. Weed City, site of an old Hollywood motion picture set, provides another sweeping panorama. At Lobato, the locomotive is briefly obscured by its own smoke as it digs in for the 4% climb to Cumbres.
The fireman also has his work cut out for him, as we can see inside the cab. We are now along Highway 17, as number 487 continues its climb. Tanglefoot Curve, just east of Cumbres, where the track nearly doubles back onto itself as it struggles to gain elevation, provided many a tall tale in the days of Rio Grande freight trains as to what transpired between the engineer in the locomotive cab and the conductor in the caboose at this point. Back at the Narrows, just outside Chama, number 484, running light, wastes no time as it heads for Cumbres. Later in the day, as the shadows are lengthening, the westbound train to Chama drifts down through the narrows. This sweeping view of the train also provides a glimpse of the passenger coaches which the Cumbres and Toltec built. Number 489 and its train soon arrive at Chama. It glides past the water tank and the well-weathered wooden coaling tower. Number 489 has been uncoupled from its train, turned on the Y located on the remaining stub of the old main line to Durango west of Chama, and returns light to the servicing area.
Despite the nearby coaling tower, a bucket loader is used to dump coal into the tender. And the sanding tower? Hoisting a heavy bucket onto the deck and dumping the sand from it into the sand dome will do quite well, thank you. It is the next morning at the opposite end of the Cumbres and Toltec as Mikado number 487 leads the westbound train out of Antonito. In the days of the Rio Grande, this was where the standard gauge third rail ended. There was no water tank at Sublet, but a gravity-fed water column refreshes the thirsty locomotive. This is the only time we've seen a ritual quite like this. The fireman places a brace firmly between the nozzle of the water column and the water opening of the tender tank. Despite this precaution, the column was still quite successful in flooding the deck of the tank when the water was turned on. Soon, the tank is full, and it is time to get underway again. Osier, the midpoint of the Cumbres and Toltec, is where the two trains from Chama and Antonito meet. The engines continue through, but the cars return to their originating terminals. Today, the eastbound train from Chama is the first arrival.
Once the train has arrived, there are no wasted motions as the locomotive is cut off and run to the water tank. The eaves of the tank are also the home for hundreds of swallows who built their nests of mud and straw all around the edge. There are always drops of water steadily dripping from the ponderous old wood tank. As the drops fall, number 487 gets underway with its westbound train headed back to Chama. The train rounds the curve and disappears in the distance in a scene that conveys the vastness of the mountain desert of southern Colorado and northern New Mexico. We take our last nostalgic look at the Cumbres and Toltec as number 487 and its train enters Chama through the two-section overhead truss bridge across the Chama River. Once part of the line that connected to Chama, the Durango and Silverton still travels on the old Rio Grande right-of-way through dramatic scenery. Durango in southwestern Colorado inspired the late railroad writer Lucius Beebe to eloquent prose, and for good reason. For what in the 1940s was a Rio Grande mixed train to Silverton in imminent danger of extinction has blossomed into today's 45-mile Durango and Silverton narrow-gauge railroad.
There are mountains in Colorado. How about this rare vantage point on one of them as we photograph a Durango and Silverton train crossing Los Animas River on its way north out of Durango. Also note the cinder catching trap on the stack of this K-28 mic, reminiscent of the old Colorado and Southern narrow gauge. Tim Lab shot this unique perspective from across the gorge of a train climbing along the very edge of the narrow shelf blasted out of the cliff in Rockwood Canyon. This is one of the most famous and spectacular locations on the Silverton Line. Silverton, northern terminus of the railroad, is located in a broad valley surrounded on all sides by towering mountains, all the better for steam locomotive whistles to echo off their flanks. A northbound train is entering Silverton. northbound train is met by a southbound which has turned on the Y and is waiting to leave town. Another view by Tim Lab shows a southbound gliding down grade along the narrow shelf through Rockwood Canyon. There is a single inside guardrail on the well-maintained track, but that is all there is, other than the practiced hands of the engineers who operate the trains very slowly through the canyon to prevent a mishap. This rock cut was a favorite location for several Hollywood westerns which were shot along this track. Locomotive number 497 pulling this train is one of several class K-37 Mikados used on both the Durango and Silverton and the Cumbrace and Toltec. 
These were the largest and last mics provided to the Denver and Rio Grande Western Narrow Gauge Lines and were rebuilt in 1930 at the Rio Grande's Burnham Shops in Denver from standard gauge consolidations. Durango and Silverton's number 478 rounds a curve south of Rockwood and rolls alongside a creek that provides a reflection of the train. The curve and inactive water tank at Hermosa are our next landmarks on this steam journey. followed shortly by the bridges which mark the Durango and Silverton's entry into Durango. The train has entered the compact yard at Durango and will soon turn around on the loop track south of the station. The locomotive is serviced and heads for the roundhouse to end another successful day and to end our steam journey through Colorado and a little of New Mexico over present-day rails which are only 36 inches apart. By the late 60s, the Denver and Rio Grande was strongly threatening abandonment of the narrow gauge operations. The railroad had pulled up a number of branches, such as the Salida to Gunnison branch and the remainder of the Gunnison to Montrose line but the main line between Antonito and Silverton was still intact. The Rocky Mountain Railroad Club was concerned this abandonment would soon take place and arrange for a special chartered passenger train over the remainder of the line. Emery Goulash, an avid photographer and narrow gauge fan, purchased a ticket for the train and promptly set off to film the train on its trek from Antonito at the eastern end of the line to Durango at the western or northern end. His incredible photography of this trip captured for all time the vastness and color of the little railroad. The orange cars, borrowed from the Silverton branch for the trip, stood out among the rich greens and browns of the San Juan Mountains. Travel with us now on the last scheduled passenger train on the Rio Grande in Colorado Narrow Gauge Passenger Chase. It is May 29, 1965, 
and the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club members stand around the K-36 class loco, watching the servicing and switching as any rail fan would. The crisp morning air in Alamosa swells with a smell of steam. Is there anything else that could enliven the heart of a true rail fan? Locos number 480 to 489 were class K-36 engines. They were built by Baldwin in 1925. The Locos developed 36,200 pounds of tractive effort. Leaving Alamosa, black clouds of smoke greet the photographer as the train pulls out of the yard. The line from Alamosa to Antonito parallels Highway 285 running south out of Alamosa. The line was dual gauged on this part and made for some interesting train chasing right up to the end of dual gauge operations. Let's follow Emery and his camera over this high speed portion of the line. Just outside of Antonito, the train rounds a broad curve and heads through town. At the south end of town, an old stone station was built to serve the railroad. Here, water and coal were also available for the locos. The line then branched off to the west. A few miles west of Antonito, the train enters the Carson National Forest. The scenery dramatically changes here from sagebrush and scrub vegetation to rolling foothills of the San Juan Mountains. Between here and Chama, the train crosses the state line between Colorado and New Mexico eight times before reaching Chama. The tracks travel through some of the most incredible scenery the railroad had to offer. Scenery that was, for the most part, inaccessible for a train chase.
The train passes through the Toltec Gorge region, and the tracks open into a sweeping valley cut through by the Rio de los Pinos River. Snow has not yet melted at this 9,710-foot elevation. The portion of the line between Antonito and Chama is well known today, for the Cumbres and Toltec thrills rail fans and many others each year as it makes its daily runs during the late spring through early fall. The railroad had to erect a bridge in the middle of the valley to cross the Los Pinos River. The tracks are almost level at this point, but soon the train will round a curve at the end of the valley and start its climb to the summit at Cumbres. At elevation 9,710, the Los Pinos water tank is still used today. This tank was built in 1880 and is the nesting home for many cliff swallows. At milepost 329, the railroad entered Tanglefoot Curve. Some excellent engineering allowed the train to wind back on itself to gain elevation. At one point in the curve, the tracks almost touch. At Cumbres, 10,000 15 foot above sea level, the train pauses for water and photos. After leaving Cumbrace, the train begins the easy part of the journey, rounding Windy Point the grade begins to descend at a steady 4%. Highway 17 crosses the tracks at Coxo. There are probably tens of thousands of photographs taken at this location, with lofty Windy Point in the background. At Cresco, the railroad built a passing siding. During the 1890s, a coal house and platform existed here, most likely to serve the rotary snow plows which kept this high line open during the tough winters.
Many S-curves parallel Highway 17. Even today, they serve as great vantage points for photographers. The train passes Lobo Lodge. Today, these cabins are rented to hunters and fishermen. A spur existed here at one time and was used to load timber by a Chama lumberman. Lobato Trestle was built of steel in 1920. It crosses the Wolf River and is 100 feet high and 340 feet long. Meanwhile at Chama, the crews wait for the arrival of the train. Chama was a division point for the railroad. It served as a helper stop for trains heading toward Cumbres as well as a lumber town. Extensive train servicing could be completed here when necessary. The train continues its westerly journey after it leaves Chama. The tracks of the Cumbres and Toltec end here today, and a Y serves to turn locos. The tracks cross the San Juan River, just east of Pagosa Junction, also known as Gato. They parallel the river for a time, creating a most incredible train-watching scene. Pagosa Junction served as a water stop. Today, this scene is preserved by native Indians. The track and structures still exist, as well as the bridge west of the tank.
The train follows the San Juan River as it heads toward Durango. The Navajo Reservoir project in New Mexico required a relocation of the narrow gauge track and the construction of some new trestles. This location served as an excellent photo run by for the passengers. The track runs quite level between here and Tiffany, and the engineer of the 483 opens her up a bit, well, for a narrow gauge. At Tiffany, an old mercantile store sat near the tracks. Its charm did not get past Emery's camera. An old tender tank served as a water stop at our bowl. Once more, the train crosses the bridge before entering into Pagosa Junction and another water stop.
The San Juan River Bridge serves as a picture postcard scene for the special. One mile east of Monero, the train passes a water tank and then crosses a wooden trestle. Highway 84, just east of Monero, served as an excellent vantage point for train photography. The yard crew again waits for the arrival of the special. The rotary is still in use today. The 483 is uncoupled from the train for servicing. K37 class number 498 will be coupled to the front for the tortuous climb to Cumbrace. Once again at Lobato, the locos are uncoupled. Safety regulations prevented running both locos over the bridge at once. When the Rio Grande ran freight over this line, they usually separated the locos in the train to avoid this maneuver. Once again, the train traverses the S-curves along Highway 17.
photo run by was staged for the fans at the Coxo Crossing. later. About 40 minutes later, the 483 pulled into Antonito. Although the loco stopped at the water tank, a quick check revealed there was ample water for the run to Alamosa. The station at La Jara still exists. The track here is now only standard gauge. At the end of an incredible three days, the train pulls into Alamosa. The late afternoon sun added a glow to the orange cars and the loco making for some excellent photography. The next morning, K-28 class number 473 deadheaded the train back to Durango. The D and RGW had installed the old-time stacks on the Silverton line. They were actually spark arresters. When Charles Bradshaw took over the Silverton line, he removed these stacks almost immediately. Let's follow the train as it races along the highway toward Antonito.
The empty train passes the Antonito station for the last time. It was the end of an era. Just two years later, the DNRGW applied for abandonment of the line, and the narrow gauge ceased operations on December 29, 1969. Between Chicago and Kansas City, the Santa Fe threads its way across 450 miles of the Midwest. Through Illinois, the Santa Fe serves towns like Streeter, Galesburg, and Chillicothe before reaching the Mississippi at Fort Madison, Iowa. In Missouri, towns like Wyconda, Gibbs, Buckland, and Marceline dot the countryside as each serves the Santa Fe in its own way. Santa Fe trains, which head west from Corwith Yard on the southwest side of Chicago, will hug the banks of the Chicago Sanitary Canal. On any day at Corwith, one can find almost constant activity at this huge classification yard. Switch engines, sometimes more than one pair, can be found tackling the myriad of sorting duties on almost any day. Incoming traffic from the west can be graced by a great variety of diesel power such as GE-840s, GP50s, and war bonnet dressed FP45s, just to name a few. Traffic leaving the yard and heading west may have just recently connected with Conrail, who serves the south end of the yard. Hotshot trains averaging 35 a day fly across the Midwest. A good example of these hotshots is eastbound 991 as it sweeps by near Harlem Avenue. and the westbound counterpart is train 199. LACH-1, a Los Angeles to Chicago hotshot double stack, rounds a picturesque curve near Willow Springs Road. and the Southwest Chief heads toward Chicago after its long trip from Los Angeles. It makes the run from Kansas City to Chicago in only eight hours with a crew change at Fort Madison. An intermodal train will make the same run in about nine and a half to ten hours with the same crew from Kansas City to Chicago. When this production was made during the summer of 1991, crews changed at Marceline and Chillicothe, but these crew change points were eliminated in late 1991. Pig trains are to be found almost everywhere on this 450 mile freeway. And this westbound at Willow Springs Road is already picking up speed for the dash across the prairie.
Soon after, the westbound Amtrak Southwest Chief makes its appearance. At Lamont, the Santa Fe makes one of its two crossings across the Chicago Sanitary Canal. Although a beehive of activity 25 years ago, Joliet can take no back seat to the astounding action on just one afternoon. The first train to grace our cameras was an eastbound TOFC. and we catch it again just east of the picturesque station. Passengers await the local westbound and Rutledge, which must be fit in between the solid blocks of freight. In between all this east and westbound traffic, the tower operator must squeeze in Metra trains as well. This one runs on X Rock Island trackage. And just a few minutes later, an eastbound TOFC crosses the diamond. Four miles west of Joliet, at milepost 40, war bonnets head an eastbound near a Commonwealth Edison power plant. A leased General Motors unit heads a Burlington Northern coal train to the Edison power plant. The BN shares trackage rights here to serve the plant.
And the Illinois Central also has trackage rights to run to Drummond, 10 miles west of Joliet, to serve a chemical plant. Westbound Amtrak follows on the heels of the IC Local. This train will go to Dwight, Illinois, where it will move on to Southern Pacific tracks. and the Southwest Chief flies by a short time later. Train number 198, another hotshot, heads slowly west at milepost 40. The train has slowed for the BN train, shown earlier, to clear the main at the power plant. At Lorenzo, the two tracks separate a bit near milepost 52.8. A trailer train flies by heading eastbound. And 10 minutes later, Train number three, the westbound Amtrak, makes its appearance. The evening air is quickly punctuated by the horn of an eastbound freight. and the freight is followed by the eastbound Ann Rutledge running in push-pull service. Southern Pacific next heads a freight westbound on shared trackage.
Cold City is located at milepost 58.2. The end of the day is graced by an eastbound double stack as it threads its way through town. The next morning, we immediately find activity at Streeter, Illinois, as an eastbound pig train heads through the yard. Before the Santa Fe abandoned its branch to Pekin, Illinois, the yard was the terminating point for the branch's locals. And quite soon after, a westbound pig train heads through town. Chillicothe was one of three crew change points between Chicago and Kansas City. Along with Marceline, Missouri, this crew change operation was eliminated late in 1991. Santa Fe paid for crews to relocate families before the 1991 to 1992 school year began. They also offered cash settlements for those who chose not to move. We're at milepost 130. This crew change took only two and a half minutes and westbound number 165 was on its way. QHOH and eastbound next makes an appearance. Beside a crew change point, this location is known for two major geographical items. One is the Illinois River Bridge east of town, and the other is the famous Edelstein Hill west of town. Nine curves on Edelstein limit train speeds to 50 miles per hour. This is the only grade over 1% on the Chicago to Kansas City main.
we relocate to the east side of Edelstein Hill, just in time to catch number 96109 heading eastbound. It's running late because of the large amount of traffic this day. The top of the grade is just west of here. The train crests the grade and begins the curving path downgrade. Nine seventy one zero eight also heads down grade, but using the left track. We are just east of the grade's crest. And here is 97108 as it reaches the top of the hill. late this day is number 19811. It has just crested the hill and will begin its descent westbound. At Williamsfield, milepost 158.4, an extra eastbounder rounds a broad curve as it heads through town. West of Galesburg, Amtrak train number three is right on time as it heads into a beautiful Midwestern sunset. The town of Cameron is located at milepost 186. Here the Santa Fe crosses over the Burlington Northern. An eastbound Conrail run through passes the picturesque site. The Conrail train started in Kansas City and will go to Streeter where it will cut over to Conrail trackage. And we see the same train as it passes through Galesburg. BN eastbound unit coal train now graces the bridge scene. Amtrak's southwest chief is late, and while we wait, a rail car heads eastbound on the BN tracks.
Next, an eastbound general merchandise freight crosses the bridge, and we catch it here and then east of town. Eastbound Desert Wind next heads through town on BN tracks. This train is still called the California Zephyr by many on the railroad, as well as the locals. And finally, the eastbound Southwest Chief makes its appearance. Milepost 191.9 highlights a location called Armand. We're in luck because here comes the eastbound mail. And the westbound mail flies through just a bit later. two miles west and another eastbound mail. Soon a spectacular view awaits us at Smithshire. The trestle at Media provides a great view for Santa Fe trains.
and an eastbound soon crosses the trestle. This trestle is located in milepost 204. West of Stronghurst, at milepost 208.9, we catch a westbound as it crests the grade. Fort Madison, Iowa is also a crew change point. Paddle wheel steamers lays up and down the Mississippi, while train action galore occurs in front of the yard office and the Amtrak station. This is the only crew change point between Chicago and Kansas City as of fall 1991. Another eastbound TOFC pulls out after a crew change. A bridge west of the yard serves as a great vantage point to catch the eastbound Amtrak number four.
and an eastbound TOFC follows the Amtrak. Delightfully ending the activities at Fort Madison, a switcher shifts a cut of cars through the yard. Maintenance is an expensive and necessary problem on all railroads. The Santa Fe's main line is a sleek, fast operation, and stabilization of track to assure a smooth and flat surface is a constant maintenance problem. This outside contractor provides the necessary equipment to pump a concrete-based product into the soil beneath the track to bolster it up against sinking. This is a fascinating operation to watch as well. And soon an eastbound flies by near the same location. We catch the same train just east of town. The stabilization equipment is brought into town and parked on a siding for the day. Gibbs, Missouri is located at milepost 306.4. Train number 197, a westbound, zooms by three of our cameras with a mail train. This train is a Grand Trunk run-through. An S-curve west of Gibbs provides a grand view. We will see the same train framed by an old bridge just a mile east.
and very shortly after, a westbound double stack passes our vantage point. Eastbound general merchandise passes beneath the bridge. Many trains during the summer months are run in multiple sections. Our outing at Gibbs this day is indicative of the heavy traffic which must be shuffled between Chicago and Kansas City on a typical day. And track maintenance must be squeezed in between all this activity. Here a Santa Fe rail car gets out of the way between trains. Not too soon after, another eastbound passes the crossing at Gibbs, and our second vantage point just a bit east of this crossing. The 5100 chases a rail car as it approaches the bridge. Santa Fe rules require the rail car operators to leave the vehicle before the train passes, and this operator complies and checks the train for any defects as it goes by. And the last freight train at Gibbs ends an incredible amount of train watching in just a few hours, as this one heads westbound and is caught at our two favorite locations. Amtrak provides a fitting end to the activities at Gibbs. Music 
Norfolk Southern crosses over the Santa Fe at La Plata. Here, a northbound favors us with a great view. On this day, a track maintenance crew was heading for a hard day's work. This truck crane is just one of many varieties of equipment which can be found up and down the line. East of Ethel, Missouri, a general merchandise train flies by. Ethel represents a typical Santa Fe scene on the line west from Fort Madison to Kansas City. Across the vast prairie, which represents the heartland of America, the Santa Fe trains chasing across the countryside paint a picture of modern railroading at its best. At milepost 328, we catch the same train as it rounds a picture postcard curve. Just west of Ethel, another eastbound mail zips by a highway crossing. And it in turn is followed by another section of mail. Buckland is our last stop today. Santa Fe provides a great view for townspeople as the tracks transverse this typical Midwestern town.